Bonjour, everybody. Welcome to our French edition of ARG Presents. I'm your good buddy, your good pal, Amigo Aaron, joined today by Labrint. Hello. <laughs> That's all you got? I'm sorry. I was. I'll you are not out. my good buddy. <laughs> so, to join us last week, we spun the wheel. We made the exciting deal. It's not often that we, we sometimes we honor, you know, certain consoles or even certain companies, but it's the first time we've ever honored an entire country. Well, as we no, are honored, that's not true. We are honored and privileged. <laughs> okay, second time. We are honored and privileged to give you, bam, games from France. Why don't you just put that logo right on my chest? The big F. I'm not moving logos. <laughs> uh, we are going to be uh, highlighting... Uh, a couple games uh, made by the French. French uh, developers, yeah. And in some cases made for French uh, machines uh, no, uh, to a certain degree. It okay. should be a lot of fun. Uh, can you, you know, when I say to you, Brent, bam, games from France, what pops into your mind instantly? What's the first thing you think of? French fries. That's not a game. I know, but you asked me what pops in my head instantly. I'm hungry. Uh, no, I, Infra Games. You're killing me. Infra Games is probably the the number one. Infra Games. Now, what, yeah. why, why them in particular? Uh, that's just what I associate with a French developer. Yeah. I, and, and, and kind of unrightfully so, Ubisoft. Yeah. But uh, that's a different. That's kind of a different ball of wax. Yeah. We we've uh, we've actually covered. French stuff in the past on any of our multitude of shows. Oh, sure. Uh, Delphine Software is the one that comes to mind for me uh, because of stuff like uh, you know, Flashback and Other World, stuff like that. But I was surprised when I looked into this. And if, if you're watching at home, you can see scrolling up the uh, screen to the right. It's just a big list of stuff, games that were that were put together in France. Uh, they, they've done zillions and zillions of games. Newsflash, uh, because we're not in France, they've made tons of games that came here. Yeah, uh, tons and tons of games. I want to highlight a few, uh, a few of the people that uh, that were programmers in France that made stuff that you may have heard of, outside of the ones we're actually highlighting today. Right, course. right, sure. So uh, I went over. I did a little looking to see because it's hard. You know, one thing I looked at a lot this week was stuff translated from French. I can tell you that because there's, that was there was a lot of stuff. It, there's no one talking about French developers. Or French uh, designers uh, necessarily in mass in in English, but they're obviously much more interested in France. Uh, I want to talk about uh, firstly a fellow named uh, Mikhail Ansel, or I think it's Mikhail, or is that Michelle? Either way, it's another reason we don't cover the big F too often. Uh, he was uh, he's a, a gentleman that was uh, a French designer, and he's responsible for. What we know over here as the uh, Raymond uh, games. Yeah. Now those super games were, popular. You think they're super popular? They yes. got ported everywhere. But they, I mean, they, have you? What's your? No, their, their sales are good. Uh, yeah, it's a very popular character. He's actually uh, showed up in many different games. Uh, he's also responsible for Beyond Good and Evil, which is a uh, underappreciated classic from back in the day. Uh, that was a, what was that on? Do you recall what that was? What, let me see. Was that on the what was that Xbox title? Beyond Good and Evil? Or, do you remember? What, I can't remember. It's been so long since I played it. <clears throat> the uh, sequel, Beyond Good and Evil Two. I think I, I, I think that's dead in the water. Uh, which is probably I don't know. After the E3 uh, debut, I thought the trailer looked interesting, but it didn't look anything like Beyond Good and Evil. Uh, the thing with Beyond Good and Evil, first of all. Uh, female protagonist, yeah, uh, and had a lot of elements of gameplay that are more commonplace now, but you didn't really see back in the time when you were, you took a lot of photographs. It was more of a a uh, it was I mean it was an action platformer, three D action platformer, but it had a different vibe and it had a spectacular world, and it was all put together, you know, from him. Yeah, so impressive stuff. Yeah. I want to talk about a fellow named David Cage. He's in the news right now. I mean, more or less because he's the writer director of that new of the game Detroit. Uh, uh, yeah, be, uh, Detroit Beyond Human. But the game I remember him for, uh, if you way way back, was Omicron. The uh, <clears throat> and the reason I remember this game 
It's because David Bowie songs were in it. Do you remember this? I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's bad. That's bad. We, I, well, I, I see this Detroit thing everywhere. Detroit. This is a big deal. Yeah, well, I mean, it was. It's, I mean, it's, it's star has already shined yeah. bright and started to fade. But the thing with Detroit Young Human is, first of all, incredible story. Did he write the story for that era? He wrote and directed. Yeah. yeah an incredible story. I mean, it's, it's the whole sci-fi fighting for the rights to be considered sentient and all that good stuff. But I, I felt it was done in a very uh, intriguing way. Um, also, it is, by far, it's it's a interactive movie, an interactive story yeah. with actual <laughs> gameplay elements. But for the most part, it's an interactive story. You know, we've talked about these on the show several times. Uh, I actually very much enjoy interactive stories, but I, it, they're not video games. I mean, in Detroit Beyond Human, probably enough in there to be considered a video game. Uh, but I think that really that type of game needs its own category that it doesn't get. And I think it would be more popular if it got that. I don't know. It's just a category. Oh no! I, I <laughs> don't, don't know. But I think people, I think people look down on games like that because they approach them expecting action or more uh, uh, control over your character. Yeah. When that's not what you get. You're you're playing through a story. You're experiencing a story that the author or designer wanted to tell you. And in that case, uh, he did an incredible job. It's a very very fun and very. Uh, 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 compelling story and narrative. You know, and by the way, if you're on our Discord, someone posted a hilarious matchup yeah. where Frank Drebin from Police Squad goes to Detroit. So I, I recommend that. Yeah. Now I'm going to talk about a fair. I'm going to try to get this right. This name. I should know this. We've said it on the show. Uh, Eric Shahai. All right. How's sure. That sound? Does that sound good? Uh, Sounds like a butchered French name. He was. <laughs> thank you. He was the creator of Another World and Heart of Darkness. Yep. And a game we covered on this show many uh, uh, years ago on the Auric Doggy, if you'll yes. recall. Uh, this, of course, what needs to be said, <laughs> he put out some top shelf stuff right there. Uh, he also did Future Wars, uh, which is a game we covered over on uh, Amigos. A while back, which is a, it's a fun, it's an interesting game. It's definitely uh, it's unique, that's for sure. But this guy, of course, widely celebrated uh, fellow as well. You, and, you've, you've played both. Uh, you've played Another World. I'm all about Heart of Darkness. I know you've played Another World. Yeah, early. absolutely. Well, here's something I want to also highlight. Yeah, I think any developer that can go from making things in the mid to late '80s. Yeah. And is still producing and developing and creating in today's world. That's super impressive. Yeah. The technological advancements that we've had since the 80s in computing and staying on top of that and being able to utilize that power uh, to make new and exciting games is is incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. I know I've, I did tech work up to about five years ago, right? And I, I really stayed up on my tech game. And in those five years, technology hasn't changed nearly as much. And I'm already lost on a lot of things, a lot of technology that if I needed to go back and mess with, I'd have to completely re-educate myself. To be able to do that for several decades, yeah. incredibly impressive. And he's someone uh, just like Dave Cage. Or David Case that was able to do that. Yeah. So big thumbs up to, for people that do that. Uh, last I want to because we've been watching. Uh, if you're watching the video, we've been looking at some of the highlights from Delphi Studios. Uh, the uh, uh, one of the big dogs over there. He was the lead designer over at Delphi. Was Paul Cousset. Uh Amongst his uh, uh, contributions, some of my favorite stuff in here, and some of my guilty pleasures. Of course, he did flashback. Yeah. Not too bad. Uh, he also did uh, Shock Fu. Remember Shock Fu? I mean, Bo played that. I mean, <laughs> it's not the worst. It's not the worst at all. I kind of dug it. He did. He did the, the mo a couple of the Moto Racer series. And I like those. You remember those? Yeah. Uh, I thought those were. Faded. I think he did the entire uh, run of those. He did Cruise for Corpse. Some good stuff. There. He was also involved in Future Wars. A lot of the big Delphi titles on the Amiga. He was involved in Cruise for Corpse. 
was a real, <clears throat> we played that on Amiga, is a real unique murder mystery, probably ahead of its time, uh, if, I'm, if, I, if I'm honest. There's some, there were some hiccups in there, but still, was a, I mean, it was a really uh, uh, daring, it was a daring effort for that era of computing to put something like that together that's based on, like, the actual real time and stuff happening. Right. That you, you know, scenes that you can miss. It was it, a pretty neat game. Paul highlights uh, uh, the other aspect of a designer, and really he has it all, uh, where not only do they transcend time, they also transcend genres. Who would have thought the same person was behind a flashback as Shaq Fu? Now, obviously... <laughs> well, de- <laughs> Yeah, I can see it. I mean, uh, Shaq, I, I mean, obviously Shaq Fu. But oh, no, I'm not. Even, I'm not even talking about visually. I'm talking yeah. about just concept wise. Uh, obviously, Shaq Fu, not the hit flashback was, but to be able to even consider that kind of genre, we have so many developers in modern gaming that are known or famous for one thing, right? Or yeah. one genre. You know, this is your RP. You know, your role playing guy. This is your the guy that does all your fighting stuff. And to be able to specialize, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. Because uh, that, that's when you really get in there and start tweaking the core uh, mechanics that really broaden gaming to give us new levels of those type of games. But to also, there has to be uh, uh, a special place in my heart for someone who's willing to say, you know what, this was fun. I feel like I've done this, this action platformer. Now I'm going to go over here and do a fighting game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With, some, so, with mixed results. Well, you know, but... I will say, I think... He I, put it out there, and I that's good enough for me. I think the original Fu is not the ultra dog. Though. I mean, it's dumb, but it, I think it's not that bad. Just to, just to seal the gap on that. I thought it's definitely a different take. It's like you said, it's like some people that just said, well, let's try a hand in a fighting game using our artistic skills. Because it's a beautiful game. Oh yeah, and on the Amiga, well it, 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 on the Amiga, it was I would say it's in the upper tier of, uh, it's not the upper half of the Amiga <laughs> fighting game. So there you go. So a lot of good stuff <laughs> doesn't hurt that the Amiga has a lot of crap fighters. <laughs> yeah, a lot of good stuff. And if you saw the the list floating by, I mean, it was like hundreds and hundreds of entries. Of course, long. I mean, I mean, yeah, they, they France so, is a big place. But I mean, France is a huge uh, player in the video game market. Yeah, so everyone thinks of stuff places like Japan or even the UK. Yeah, back in the day, but the, the French and they really, in some ways, they they give their self to the world. But there was also a time where they. Their software was basically uh, stuff that they did uh, that stayed in France. So it's a little bit of both. Anytime you, know. you have to worry about that translation, overcoming the language barrier, uh, because it is so expensive in video games. Yeah. To to have, especially, I mean, it depends on your game, of course. If all you're doing is translating, start options, you know, sound test, that kind of crap, it's not so bad. But anything that has any kind of meat, any kind of story-driven games, it's really tough to get those outside of the native language because of the cost involved. Yeah, and I don't. I, I'm not saying that's what kept a lot of pl- things, a lot of games in France, but I guarantee it had at least some uh, some constraining aspects. I mean, think about the amount of things that no one made here from Japan, for example. Oh yeah, you know, it's a, it, there's there are cultural barriers or issues with translation, sure. so it's there's many things. But luckily, a lot of stuff did make, it. and so. Uh, since we were doing uh, Made in France, uh, I'll lead the dance this week, Brent. With, really? With my okay. Answer. I'll lead the dance this week. So, yeah, I wanted to play something that was was basically a French design and and originally appeared on a French uh, a system you would associate with France. <clears throat> when I think of a system I associate with France, I think of the old Thompson computers that we covered way way back. Yeah, we've actually we've. We've been we've done French stuff really more th- times than you would than we would think, and so this was not that difficult for us to find something in that area. Now getting some of the emulation down was much more difficult for sure. But anyway, I'm sure they had C64s in France. I wanted to, I wanted they did. I want to play a game that I never heard of, and that appeared on at least one French system as its lead. And so I went with a game. I'm going to try to pronounce this in the native French in the appropriate way. Bam! It's Le five me axe, okay, or uh, the translation the fifth access, the fifth axis. Uh, I've never heard of this game. I'm guessing you've never heard of it either. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so 
This was a game uh, from Laura Sells. How many games have we covered from them over the years? More than a couple. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is another, and we've talked about Laura Sells. I mean, several times they were a, they were a big player. They put out a ton of stuff. That they when I think of the best game they ever did, I've got to go with the uh, with their uh, uh, with the fighting game. Shoot, what was the name of that game? The kickboxing game that we played over and over. It's got different names. Panza kickboxing. Yeah, Panza. That's my favorite game from them. But uh, they, we've, I bet we've covered ten games from Lawrence on this show. We've covered one. Uh, this game released in ninety or nineteen eighty five. That would have been a that would have been a, a disaster. <laughs> been, a, been a much worse game in the nineties. If they if they, <laughs> if they, if they, if they could have uh, uh, pulled this one off in the nineties. Anyway, this was released in nineteen eighty five. And the uh, was released on the Thompson uh, Mo and To series. Also had a Commodore sixty four and Amstrad release. Interesting that the the ZX didn't get in the loop on this one. Kind of it, it struck me as odd. Uh, I don't. I think it could have probably pulled it off. This game uh, released on tapes uh, for the Thompsons and sixty four, and it actually had one of those am wacky Amstrad disc releases. So this is a game that you could get on a, on a wacky Amstrad the, the the nutty discs that they have for the Amstrad. Uh, again, uh, this was put together uh, by a, a brother team. Uh, here we go. I'm going to try to pronounce their names. Uh, Didier and Oliver Gullion. That, that's G-U-I-L-L-I-O-N. Gullion. Uh, these were these guys. I was hoping I would uncover this like long lineage of brilliance with this brother team. But right. they, as far as I could tell, they didn't do tons. And I had to dig to find the stuff they did, but I did find some stuff. In fact, I did some stuff on the Amiga. They did a game called Sapiens, as in Homo Sapiens, I guess. Right. They did a game called uh, Albedo, which appeared on the Amiga. They did a game called A Whale. That's A W A L A W A L E, A Whale. That was a game on the Mac. Sure. And then lastly, the last thing I could find from these guys was. Air Seslavi, that's uh, which was a game on the Atari ST. So these guys worked; they worked the circuit here. Sure, yeah. So <laughs> who knew? Now uh, this game, when you look at the game, it seems simple enough. Okay, and I mean ish, but when you read the documentation for this, is unbelievable. I don't know if you read the complete. I did not. No, and I'm not going to read it here. But I'm going to read. I'm going to read the sort of descriptive text that you get at the beginning of this to try to explain what you're doing here. So <clears throat> the year is 2140. So we're not too far off. We might make it. No, uh, there's no chance. Are. are you kidding me? Working, it's 120 years. Oh, we'll make it. Working from his artificial satellite orbiting around Saturn and helped by his faithful army of cyborgs. Professor Gerd B. Dick has successfully designed a time-traveling machine. Good for you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Dick. <laughs> As a way of testing his new invention, he travels to different time periods to collect iconic historical items. Can't be good when you do that. You shouldn't do that, Dr. Dick. Suddenly, the machine malfunctions and explodes, scattering parts that are called uh, anachronons in 10 different locations and time periods. As a side effect, it appears that the destruction of the machine has distorted the space-time continuum and the existence of the very universe is now at risk. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Professor <laughs> Gern B. Dick, then hastily, he loves saying that, <laughs> Professor Gern B. Dick then hastily designs a second time-traveling machine. Seems like if you could get a second one going, you could pretty much fix the problem. <clears throat> he designed a second time-traveling machine that will be used to both uh, send back the historical items scattered around the lab to their prospective periods and to collect the uh, anachronons from the same time period. To spice things up a bit, the professor's army of cyborgs went crazy and decided to attack any human that entered the lab. So this professor is a complete loser. All right, this I guy is a loser. He made two time machines. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, everything he touched turned to crap. <laughs> what was he thinking? I'm going to go around and collect stuff, and what could go wrong? You idiot, idiot Dr. Dick. So anyway, it's your job to, to work. You're working for the doctor. I guess you're, I don't know what you are exactly. It's Dude McGuy. And your job in this game is to go around collecting these uh, items that have gotten scattered 
And all the time, uh, you are fighting these uh, these bad guys who are the cyborgs that have went nuts. All right. So it, basically, it's a long-winded way of saying collect stuff, fight ro- ro- robots. That, yeah. That's pretty much yeah. all there is to it. <clears throat> this game, it's an interesting game because it's it, the first thing it does is it allows you to adjust the stat- the statistics of your of your uh, players. Yeah. You get to choose little little customization. Yeah. You get to choose between agility, uh, vitality, and strength. And these things mean something. Yeah. Strength is how much damage you will uh, will inflict on the opponent. When on you your punch punches and, and kicks. Kick. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, agility is how far... I wish I'd known this before I, I rolled up my first guy. It's like how far you could jump. Yeah, you jump length. And then length. Uh, uh, vitality, how much hit points you've got. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I probably put too many hit points in that. You know, or too many points into that. You, I, I, As I played over and over, I would adjust stuff. Because I really hit points weren't that big a deal yeah. until towards the end, uh, but uh, yeah, jumping over pits was a huge deal. But uh, I don't think longer, I don't think longer jumps would have mattered that much. But we'll get into that. So once you, and I like the fact you get to put your name in there. That's kind of cool. So once you do all this, then it's time to play the game properly. Now I've heard this game. You know, I I go through and I'm like, let's see what people thought about this. And if I had a nickel for every time some sucker said, "Oh look, it's an impossible mission to rip off." No, it's got it's. I mean, I can sort of I mean, see you where can you can see visually, it. Yeah. but I mean, game play wise, it's nothing like Impossible Mission at all. It's not the least bit like Impossible Mission. Also, there's no elevators. Well, um, I'm yeah, just saying. There are. No, there's no. But I'm saying it's not like Impossible. Have you played Impossible I, Mission? I, yes, I have. I'm not saying hmm. that it's like Impossible Mission. Yeah. However, I don't think anyone is wrong in, in saying yeah. Well, if you look it, at it without playing it, you can see where you come to that conclusion, but you'd be wrong. That's why you need to play it, son. Anyway, so your uh, character, uh, firstly, is dumped into this mm-hmm. multi-leveled, uh, I guess it's a lab a in a different time period, and you are tasked with going through and collecting all of the uh, artifacts that have been strewn throughout the level. Now, uh you're going to encounter... I don't know who built this lab. I guess these are where the time vortex or whatever screwed up the floor because <laughs> because the, this place is littered with pits. And, I mean, there are various size pits. Some you can negotiate and jump over, and some you've got a zero chance of jumping over. And sometimes you have to really sort of be careful because they're so close together that you can't jump over them correctly. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a difficult game in terms of leaping, and the controls don't help, but we'll get to that. They, they obviously, they, the, I don't think they are random, but the pit length and placement feels random. Yeah, well, they're also just, I mean, they're, I think you're right. I think they were assigned in all lot of, I mean, because the way that they're, that they put objects in tough places to get yeah. to, and it's tough. So, uh, you, we mentioned that the cyborgs in this go crazy, okay? And well, that's, don't this, mind if I do. This, this, uh, these levels are filled. With, I will say, admittedly, a variety of different cool-looking like robots. You've got spider-looking things. You've got things that look like a, 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 a drag, like a Welsh dragon, like off of like a, the flag. You've got things that just crawl around. You've got things that look like centaurs. There's a lot of bad guys in yeah. this, and they're they're real cool-looking and different, aren't they? Well, I mean, they all attack the same. Yeah, though. they just run. That's into the you. problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, the 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 design on the enemy sprites. Uh, is innovative enough visually, but they all just slam into your character to do damage. Yeah. Uh, that, that was a little disappointing, but it was neat that you had a, a, a lot of enemy sprites. Now, there, there's one thing... I like I, the grabby hand one. Yeah, one thing I do like is, your guy's just not some sort of geek who goes out there and it's, oh, I'm going to get like some kind of science nerd. This guy's a butt kicker. I can see like a movie versus and you get Von Dom in there to play this guy because this guy doesn't just go around. He kicks and punches and does and he'll throw fly if you're running, he'll throw flying kicks and stuff. And what you can do is this is great too. When you kick the robots, you can do knockback and you can knock them into the pits. Yeah. Of course they can do the same to you. Yeah. So you can get into pits. Now the pits go down to the next level. So it's not like you die when you hit the pits. You just you basically just uh you basically just go down to the next level and eventually you'll hit the bottom level. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, "Hey, what happens if I get down to the bottom level and I can't, and I or down to the bottom I can't get back up?" Well, they thought of that, and what they've got are these are things called lifts, and they are like uh, multi-line squares on the floor, 
And it's funny because they're very uh, lengths, it's, which is strange to me. But you get on them and push up with your joystick, and your guy will go up to the level above. And they look like crosswalk. They're scattered <laughs> all over the place uh, for you to for you to use. Yeah, they're oh. elevators. I mean, let's let's call a spade a spade. Yeah, but I mean, they're they're, I like it. It's just it's it's it works. Also, occasionally you'll come across a pit or something, with, and there will be symbols around it, and it will like if you can't make it across. It will sort of like yoink you across. Yeah, I thought that was the most interesting part of this. Did you I, under, uh, did you get the rhyme, the reason that the, the like I, did those always work? No, I, they were confusing. You, each thing had a symbol on it. Yeah, and you pick up those symbols along with the other things, the objects you're trying to pick up. Yeah. you don't have to pick them up, but those they're they're basically think of them like key cards. And when you go to that symbol, you, if you have the corresponding key card. You can use it and I teleport think. yourself across the longer. Yeah, pits. I was I was a little shaky on that, and I will say, uh, uh, that's a neat that's a neat element. Yeah, no, that I thought that was very clever. Uh, it also the pits that it have you cross aren't always. I mean, sometimes they are these gargantuan, complete screen length pits that yeah. you have absolutely. I mean, no, it, no matter how you set up your character, you're never going to be able to cross it. Uh, so you basically have to have a key card to do it. However, they also have some of them that are on smaller pits. So if you crank down your guy's agility and he wasn't a very good jumper, it still allowed you to use a key card and go across these pits, which I thought was pretty clever. Let's talk about controlling your character. This game, I mean, this is a very, reminds me quite a bit of a game like Another World or Flashback. Exactly. Like, because, yeah. I, of course, this is, you know, you're talking, this is an old game. Uh, when you, and this really screams for an analog controller if, they, if they'd had one back in the day. Because what you've got here is, if you barely move your joystick left or right, your guy would just turn. Yeah. If you, if you turn, if you move it to a certain direction and kind of hold it for a second, your guy will walk. And if you just hold it all the way, your guy will run. Okay. And then when you jump, you you are hitting diagonal up, on the, yeah. and your guy will jump. And you can actually throw these leaping kicks because you. And also when you fight, you it's a lot like pans in a lot of ways. You kind of hold the you the different directions with the button will do different. Like he'll do punches and kicks, yeah. different ones. So he's got he's pretty well uh, versed in the martial arts. And he's well animated. Yeah, yeah, he is. He looks really good. I now, mean, he's, a down- he's just a black and white sprite. But he's super well animated. Yeah, he looks real good. Here's the downside: uh, these control. This game requires you to really be quick with the controls, and these can this control setup is not uh, conducive to quick action. It also you will fall through pits over and over because you the, will because the running and the jumping. Again, if you've played Another World or Flashback, where you have to, it's 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 cool looking but difficult to time. And I tried, I mean, I did get better eventually, yeah. but you, you'll you come across areas where you have a long pit, then a landing, and then another pit or a short pit, and you've got to time it and set it just right. It is difficult. And, it, that, and so this is one of those games, presumably, that they designed around a difficult control scheme. Uh, because well, I guess if you had great controls, this would be a lot easier, but with these controls, you find yourself falling in pits, and it can be frustrating. Uh, it can be frustrating to go fall in those pits and all of a sudden, you went from like level five all the way down the bottom, and you're you're working your way back up. I I, I found myself doing a whole lot of tapa tapa tapa. Yeah, yeah, you got to do a tapa um, tapa tapa. There's no doubt. I, I, I yes, the controls in this game are rough. Yeah, um, they're, sen- they're very sensitive. You, you do start to learn them. Yeah. Um, but could they? I mean, yeah, they could have made the controls better. If they had used more buttons, of course, that would have helped a ton too. Well, uh, I know. <laughs> um, but the 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 level design and based on how you can configure your character, I think it's supposed to play into it more than it actually does. Um, I wish that the game was more deliberate. I wish that you could, when you ran up to a hole. There was something you could hold, or a way to position your joystick that you would stop at the edge of the hole. Because, like you said, you're going to spend a lot of your gameplay falling into holes. Yeah, and it's unpreventable. So, once you obtain uh, the the stuff you need, you will basically beam out of this level. And there's a sequence. There's a sequence where they beam you out. That's pretty cool. 
Uh, they, it's uh, like a, it's like a uh, quantum leap or it's something, okay. basically. I mean, I thought it looked pretty cool. And then you actually go, you'll go to the next level, uh, where you, uh, where they've changed things. Now this level, this is more like crossbow without the, without the ability to shoot any of the stuff. <laughs> you know, you should run. You're running. Your guy's running across. Or down it's in nothing like, a, like crossbow. Well, no, I mean, I'm saying like if you didn't have the crossbow, you just watch your guys run across the screen. That's what it reminded me of. So on this level, you're running down a uh, a, a corridor, and you're avoiding obstacles. Uh, and, and depending on what level you're on, you'll you'll get additional obstacles. Sometimes it's uh, spears. Sometimes it's boxes. Sometimes it's boxes and like holes that appear. It's different stuff, but the the main uh, point of the level is to avoid this stuff. And there are like timers clicking down at the bottom. You've got to get to the end of the level. Um, it's a basic level, uh, and I found these levels extremely difficult. I really did. I thought they. Were, I mean, I, you could get through them just because you get through them, but I mean, you get mauled a lot. And I'm wagering after you go through five or six of these, these are going to be real tough. Uh, I mean, here's the concept: uh, things will come low, medium, and high. Yeah. I mean, some things fall from the sky that will end up low, you know, on the ground. But low things you have to jump, medium things you have to attack, high things you have to duck. Yeah. It, it That description makes it sound easy, but it is actually kind of frustrating. Uh, every time you, you don't have life in this, you uh, have a timer at the bottom, and every time you get hit by something... Your guy falls down it and you time. lose five seconds. Yeah, uh, which there's a whole. It's it's not easy to get to the end, and there is no end. There is no goal that you get to. Just when you go far enough, it's like okay, you did it. You're back in the other place now. Yeah. Now I will say this. Uh, I tried this on the C64 yeah. as well, uh, and man, this it's a, level it's a way harder. is awesome. This is one of the most graphically impressive things I've seen on the C64. It's because way It's literally, <laughs> it's got parallax scrolling. Yeah. I mean, at, at a high level, Yeah, I was real impressed with the C64. Uh, in fact, I think the C64 version, as a playable version, is probably the way to go. I had a couple copies on the Amstrad as well, but I like the C64 version the best. But not to mention that I mean you still the controls are still funky. Don't get me wrong. Oh yeah. The I will say the Thompson version, which is the one I the lead version that I tried out, is once you get it running, you're okay. But man, it was I had some real. It's funny we played the Thompson M O five. I think it was a, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But man, I've lost. I've forgotten everything I remembered about emulating the Thompson. <laughs> and it's and then, uh, uh, we even tried. Uh, me and a buddy on Discord were full with the playing this in the midst of this, like an experimental core for the top, but it's just it's not there yet. And so then you have to go into the emulation. This is one of those things where you have to sort of figure it out how to load it, what the buttons do, you know, all this stuff. But it was a real, I had a real problem. I thought the controls were real bad, but I think it was, it was a combination of the emulator and the fact that the controls are tough, you know. So if you're going to play this one, uh, I would go with the C64 version. It's also graphically uh, the best. Super but impressive, yeah. This that it's funny that the Tonto version it looks it looks sharp. It don't oh, get me yeah. wrong. It's a yeah. real sharp. And, and really, the animations, which I think is key to this, I think that's the by far the most impressive part of the game is the animations. Uh, is solid on all the things that I saw it on. I, although sounds, I didn't, sound was good too. Was that, it was okay. Now, so where, where do you stand on this thing? Are you a third or get it? Um. <sighs> As a game, I wish they would have done a little bit more. It makes no sense that your guy is traveling through time with no kind of uh, uh, assistance, no kind of weaponry or... His hands are his weapon. Oh, uh, yeah, that's great. Except when you have to shoot someone across the pit so you can jump over. Well, you got to jump, jump kid. <laughs> um, but I think as it stands, this is actually a pretty fun game. Yeah. Although it does get repetitive, but because there are only two types of stages, yeah, um, and it does oh, get they do vary them up a little. The second stage varies a little bit with the stuff that comes at you. Yeah, but it's still the same basic bear, homie. Yeah, um, yeah. The the uh, uh, two stage loop is a little light. Falling in holes is a is a little frustrating, and the falling in holes thing. Yes, you do get better at the controls, but you never get so good at the controls that you avoid falling in holes. 
you never reach that point. Yeah, it's that, just not it's, gonna it's happen. It's part of the game. It's part of the game. So I do I think people should check this out. Oh yeah. 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 I, I would do the C sixty four. It's way easier to get running. Uh, it looks super impressive, especially for a C sixty four game. And the control is is just as good. <laughs> if you've got a Thompson at, the, at at your house, play it on there. Give it a shot there. Well, I mean, just, I'm just saying because yeah, I, mean, I think sure. this, this is a fun game, and it really it looks quite good on the Thompson. I'm not buried. In fact, in some ways, I like the look of the Thompson's first level better, but I, the second level, the CC4 blows No, no, yeah, away. yeah. The graphics are good across the board. You should just look at the second level just to see it. Um, so, And by the way, if you get a chance, read the 10-page document. They have interviews with Dr. Dick. There's all kinds of stuff in there. It's it's. I read it. I was like, this is this is crazy. Uh, I I looked uh, at the reviews on this. Uh, ASM uh, gave this a ninety two percent. Amtix uh, gave the Amstrad version a ninety one percent. Zap uh, gave the C sixty four version a seventy percent. And Commodore user buried this thing, but it was two years after it was out. They gave it a, a, a 50 percent. No, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Well, I mean, they totally did it. Um, I I looked on eBay. I guess someone's I could, checked it and clear. Yeah, let's see if I could find this. The only thing I could find on here was the Amstrad CPC disc version, which is I, it's cool, pretty cool looking. The cover of this thing's pretty wild looking. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you could get that for uh, forty one dollar bills. Uh, I thought this game was pretty slick. I know we've got some Discord acts on here as well. Absolutely. Did you? Did, what was the main thing that you played this on? Did you? Did you? Did you mostly play the C sixty four version? Yeah, oh this? yeah, yes. In fact, I only played the C sixty four yeah. version. Yeah. Well, I mean, did you look at the other ones? Did, what, oh yeah, yeah. What I did looked you think at of them. the Amstrad version. Of uh, I mainly focused on the C sixty four because I felt it looked the most impressive, and it certainly sounded the you're most a, impressive. You're a graphics guy, aren't you? No, no, I'm a you're game a graphic, player guy. You're a graphics guy, faux show. I mean, uh, I, I like graphics. I mean, the the uh, the sprite work on this, like I said, is is incredibly impressive. The animations, I yeah, they look good, so, really good. Although it does look kind of game and watchy because the characters, everything that moves, uh, be it bad guys or you or things that fall from the sky, et cetera, et cetera, are all just black. Yeah, black and transparent, and that kind of sucks. But it allows them to do some impressive things with animation. So I'm so okay with it. We did get a, a Discord a review from Pajako six five zero two, who was also the fellow that was. Um, we were metro at that core. Uh, Pajako writes, "This could almost have been a sequel to Mission Impossible. I think it means Impossible Mission, and it has a very similar feel. The random nature of the game lightly spoiled an otherwise great game." Holes too close together that cannot be jumped, or small elevators right next to holes uh, where you mostly end up using the elevator by accident rather than jumping are my main gripes with the game. But once you settle in, you will find a reasonably enjoyable game. I would have loved a dead stop button to make some of the jump stopping troll a little easier. Well, that'd be difficult to put in. And well, not down, have the guy carry a running, uh, not have the guy uh, carry on running when you use an elevator, but these issues. We're not showstoppers. I had a quick whirl on the CC4 and Amstrad versions as well, and although the Thompson is missing the in-game music, it actually holds its own against the other ports. I agree with that. Uh, uh, definitely in the top end of not awful category, but not the shining star it could have been. Six and a half out of ten. I think that's fair. So there you go. So there you go. So that was uh, Fifth Axis. Now, Brent, you went in a different direction, as you often do. What did you come up with? I don't uh, think Brent? I went in a different direction at all. It, I was think French is, it was French designers, and I picked a French designer. Well, what more do you want from you. me? Here's, my, here's where, I, where I would come from. I didn't know this was French. I so this is that's the kind of stuff I like. So what do you got? <clears throat> I'm taking a look at Alpha Waves. Oh, man. And uh, this is from Christophe de De Lynch. And what was he, his name again? Christophe de Delint. Oh, very good. Um, he is the he was the designer of the original game for the Atari ST, and uh, it was actually ported to the Amiga and to DOS. And we're going to touch on that a little bit. But he didn't have any direct control over those uh, outside of they took his concept and put it to the system. Yeah. Uh, but I want to talk about the man behind the game a little bit first. I kind of went into this 
looking for someone who had this incredibly long career in video games. Me too. And I failed miserably. Me too. So, <laughs> I, I thought since uh, uh, this guy was was uh, into Alpha Waves, and Alpha Waves it was an incredibly impressive feat of engineering, if nothing else. Uh, so I thought, man, he's got to be he's got to be pushing the envelope in gaming. He didn't. Uh, he actually, this is his only uh, ST game that he's gotten credit for. Uh, so this was the ST was the lead. It was the lead machine on this. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, after this, the only aspect he did in video games was he made games for the uh, HP forty eight calculators. He made uh, uh, Lemmings and Pac Man. Oh, no, the yeah, no, for the calculator. He didn't actually make the games. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, he made Lemmings. <clears throat> he made Lemmings. He made Pac Man and the impressive and uh, Tetris and a few others. They've got Lemmings in the calculator. Yeah, and the impressive thing that he accomplished on these calculators was he had scrolling, two directional scro scrolling. Uh, and the reason why he was probably able to do that is he worked on the uh, the programming language behind the scenes, and he did that for several several different programming languages, uh, especially for the uh, Atari. Uh, he also dabbled in some C++ stuff uh, on down the line. And what he did was he actually left gaming after his exploits on the calcu on the HP calculators. He went off and did his own thing with computer animation. Uh, and he did this in a time when computer animation was starting to get big. You started to see it more on television, uh, even on things that you don't think about, uh, much like the Amiga was famous for. You know, oh, news overlays that will have a, a spinning logo or something. It's stuff that we don't even think about now. It's just like, okay, there's a spinning logo. I'm sure that took someone, you know, 30 seconds in, in one of 18,000 programs. But all of that had a beginning. And he actually opened his own company uh, where he had attempted to, to do this and make it big. Uh, and the name of that company was Tyodyne. Uh, they are still technically functioning today. Uh, I, I went to try to find out where the company was. Um, on his YouTube channel, they haven't updated in seven years. Uh, on uh, different web pages, I found where it would talk about the company and what they were trying to accomplish. Uh, again, it was about a seven years since any update. But from everything I can tell, uh, because their Twitter feed is still active, I'm assuming they're still a functioning company. It looks like they've got about 10 members. And like I said, they do a lot of things with simple 3D graphics, but real-time stuff. So uh, kudos for him on that. So let's fall back and actually look at Alpha Wave, the game. Now, uh, this is, I mean, it's a 3D platformer, and it is among the first 3D platform, some give it credit as the first 3D platformer. It was released in 1990. And to get an idea of what was going on in 1990, this is one of those times you have to look at some of the games that were being released around it. We're talking Super Mario World, F-Zero, uh, Smash TV, Metal Gear Solid 2. These are all intensively superly impressive sprite-based video games. Now, sure, the sprites might be in, so, in sort of a, a, a faux 3D environment, um, but this is the peak, the peak of spriteness. This is the peak of sprite animation, of sprite manipulation. Uh, you even have games like F-Zero, where they're using the, uh, uh, the power of the Super Nintendo to do this cool rotations and stuff, but it's all sprite-based stuff. And that's where Alpha Waves is incredibly different because it is a 3D, fully 3D environment. Uh, so much so that you can, in the options, 
the game is natively behind the character, uh, and the character is basically a, a triangle that sort of represents a ship, kind of, that bounces. Uh, kind of think of like the Pixar logo lamp. I feel like it, there's a couple of different types. Of yeah, stuff, there right? is, yeah. Um, but you can even choose options to go first person with this. Did you do that at all? Oh, God, no. Uh, no, that's that's how I tried to play the game. I don't know how you make it do that. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. The controls in this are weird uh, yeah. because you don't you don't run. You don't move through the environment. What you do is rotate the camera and then push your ship. Your ship, as long as it is not touching bare ground, and bare ground can still be up in the air, it's just basically a designated tile that says, this tile won't let you bounce. Uh, your ship will continuously bounce and get higher and higher. And what you do is use this height gain along with the thrusters on your ship to push your ship forward to navigate a room inside a cube where you try to get to an exit. That is the game. Um, it's a very... It's a very simple concept, but this was designed in a time when these type of games simply did not exist. Um, it would be many years before we got the things like Super Mario 64 and really saw 3D platforming, Tomb Raiders, that sort of thing, taken to an absurdly higher level. This was on the Atari ST, for goodness sakes. They didn't have GPUs to push this kind of, uh, of information out to your screen. This used Vectrix, and it was so intense, they couldn't use complex Vectrix they used addition. All of the, the scrolling, the resizing of the squares and the room and stuff are all done by just adding and subtracting numbers to your lines, which is crazy to think about. And it pushed the CPU for the Atari ST so hard that they literally, that's the only way they could do it. Uh, the ST, uh, famously known for its, it, its ability to do this kind of thing uh, when compared to something like the Amiga. I'm not comparing, I'm not saying uh, alpha waves on, on the ST versus the Amiga, but the, just the ability to do this, the ST was probably one of the best systems at the time to be able to do this sort of thing. It had a little thing. higher clock speed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So uh, alpha waves, you could easily look at this game and say, this is a kind of a neat demo. Where's the actual game? Because you you go in to the menu system, you either just pick play the game where you have a time limit and you bounce around this cube and you try to go to different rooms and you try to get through all the levels, uh, which is impossible because my understanding, there is no end. It always just puts you... Your, your cube is in another cube, and so you just kind of go around in circles, basically. Big circles, but still circles, nevertheless. You can pick up items uh, to give you, like, uh, extra time for your clock, for example. But for the most part, the core game is just bouncing on these platforms, trying to go into these doors, and going to the next room and doing the same thing. The other mode is the emotions mode, where... There are a set of maps that they correspond with a different type of emotion. Uh, calm or angry or whatever. And you're supposed to play through these levels at your own pace and it will help you get to that emotion. Or it's supposed to uh, uh, bring out that emotion or however you want to say it. Uh, th this is garbage. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 it's. I think they tried to artsy the game up, which I guess considering what they had, they had to do something to try to sell this because this game does not sell on itself. It really doesn't. I, you had you had to do something to push this uh, uh, to get it onto shelves to make someone look at it. That the technology is incredible. I'm not saying anything like that. But as a game, 
there's not a whole lot of game here. So I think that's why they kind of did that. Um, like I said, this did come out on the ST, the Amiga, on DOS. ST, obviously, the first. Uh, it had a two-player simultaneous mode where it would split the screen and you would both try to work through this, uh, the rooms together. Uh, it did not run well in my experience. I don't know if you played with that I didn't at all. Try two player. Um, that sounds cool to me. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and then this came out on the Amiga, and the Amiga is superior to the ST just because it adds some music in, not necessarily during gameplay, but just other aspects of the game. And then it came out on DOS. And the problem with DOS is the way this was programmed, the concept of it was if you had a fast DOS machine, this game would play so fast that it would be, become unplayable. And it's barely playable as it is. You played this on DOS, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, and you really had to crank down the clock speed. That's you, what we're looking at, by the way, if you're watching the video. This is a DOS playthrough. Uh, but the DOS is superior in that it has music during gameplay. Uh, it has uh, 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 more levels, more expansive levels. Um, but the concept is still the same. You're a ship bouncing on squares trying to exit the room. Now, Aaron, I know you had said you had played this before. Yeah. Uh, going back at to it, looking at it, fresh new eyes. What were your What was your take on this? Well, I was happy. I was real happy you picked this because we first stumbled across this. I think it was on one of the old uh, Amiga Thons. Yeah, and I remember playing this. You know, listen, this is the streamers. You know, I, I I'm a I'll jump around, jump around, and so that when a game that isn't doing it for me, that game's gone. Right, I'll be like, I'm oh, moving on, especially when yep. I'm playing Amiga stuff. And because there's so much in the library, and this is a game where I loaded it up, I'm like, look at this, and I'm like, I fiddle with it for a second, and I was getting ready to give this thing the gong, you know, and something told me, it's like, wait a minute, this is unusual, and so I stuck with it, and I was like, man, there, this is something different here. Yeah. This is really unique. I mean, not just because of the of the way it's the you know the art style, but I mean, just the fact that it's a it's a concept that is very unusual. The whole bouncing thing, it's a, it's, it gives you a real uh, odd feeling to play. And going back to it, I've, I've tried, I played it this week on the Amiga and on DOS, uh, and because I'd played on Amiga before. And I, I, I like the Amiga version because I'm used to it. But I mean, they're, they're I'm not going to say they're exactly the same, but it's the same basic deal yeah. on them. So it's not like you can't play them on either one. Yeah. Uh, but it's fun. It's frustrating. You have to get used to it. Uh, the controls are nutty. I mean, but I mean, I, I think it's a real unique take uh, on, on. I mean, I've never. I don't. I would say it's a unique take on the genre. But there's no genre. Yeah. It's its own genre. The hopping around uh, is it, it, it's unusual. I enjoyed it. It's fun. I think when you get to an elevator. Like, uh, you actually feel like you did something. You know, you're like, man, it's a good feeling when you get to that platform. I brought this back on one of the uh, disaster streams one time and played it again there. So this is sort of, I'm not going to say it's a perennial favorite, but it's a game I, I enjoy. Uh, and I had no idea that it was, uh, I should have known because of Infogrames, but I didn't know it was a French design, French made. And I think it's some outside of the box. You could tell the guy that made this was a genius. You know, because I, I, I mean, I just, it's, I think there's a lot of cleverness in it. That I just think it's a cool game. And so going back to it, I enjoyed it. I played it a lot this week. I played this one more than I did mine, uh, just because it's fun. I like the fact that, I mean, think of what this guy pushes out of these machines. It's not just the the shapes and the bouncing and the and the and the 3D perspective, but he also adds in stuff. Stuff shoots at you. There's little ships that fly around. Little stuff. There's like this, like segmented dragon that you'll see on some levels it's cool that's awesome i mean i like that so even with all this stuff going on there's enough juice left to where you can add some other interesting stuff there's variances there are different there are um there are jump points that are angled and stuff that you have to sort of bounce back and forth of them there's not necessarily a right path you can sort of do your own thing sometimes sometimes you can't right but i mean i i really think this is a fun one i i was happy to see you pick this one 
uh, I will agree with you and disagree with you. First of all, I do not think Kristoff was a genius. Oh. I think he was at least not a genius developer. Uh, I think he was a good programmer um, that had a vision of what the ST could do uh, in a 3D environment. I don't think he had the developer chops to go in there and make a compelling game. I don't think Alpha Waves is a compelling game. No. I think that uh, Alpha Waves is showing a technology that didn't exist until it was until he created it, and he didn't either know how, have the time or the experience to bring it into a more functional game. I think what it is, is incredible. I think being able to uh, push the ST, and, and the ST is really what got pushed. I mean, the Amiga got pushed too, because it, this isn't something Amiga does, uh, this type of game. But I, 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 think, I think pushing... I think being able to push the technology was incredible. I just think the game falls incredibly flat. Uh, I am in the minority with this, though. Yeah. This reviewed uh, fairly well back in the day. You're looking at uh, usually 70s and above across the board. I think that's a little generous. I think that is definitely... I think it's low. I th well, I mean, they. I said and above. No. Um, there were many 80s. And some 90s. I can't understand why you're crapping on this game. I'm not crapping. Because there's a no. game here. And plus, it's got two, two players simultaneous. There's a lot of fun here. I know when we played this, this was like a party game. We were People were into it. People were enjoying it. I think you're underselling the fun of this game. You don't need a story. I, no, it's I don't. more like a platform puzzler. You I, have to get out. That's what the fun of it is. I had way more fun with your game than I did this. Nah, because there's, a, you know, this there's, a there's also you something you have to realize. There are going to be... This is old-time 3D. <clears throat> it oh, is going yeah. to nauseate some people uh, because it's not at a high enough frame rate that things are smooth. Did it nauseate you when you played? Uh, there are definitely times I was like... But I did play a lot in first person. That probably what did. So that there is that. Because otherwise you have to rely on the shadows yeah. to make the jump. And then you're just staring at the shadow. And to me, that completely defeats the purpose. I wanted to feel like I was jumping from platform to platform. And when you go into first person, you can also turn on like wireframe and it yeah. does run a little bit better. But and all that kind of stuff. Right there. I was just thinking this would be a great candidate for VR. You could put the helmet oh, on. Oh, God, no. You would throw oh, up listen, all over no, the place. No, it didn't make me sick. I didn't get the um, least bit nauseous from playing this. But, well, it's, it's... Of course, I'm all man. It's because of the frame rate. It's It's... Not jittery. I'm not saying it's jittery, but it's not smooth. It, it's, it's not this sm weird. It's, not the it's this weird in between. How about a remake of this for a modern machine? And Why? Like, Why would you remake this? Because it's fun. No. Oh come on. No. No, they didn't remake this. They called it Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider. Yeah. I no. Mean, you, this. I like the platform element torn down to its bare level. No. That's what I like Th about this it. This is a concept, and I'm impressed by the concept. But as a game, it just doesn't do it for me. We got a Discord review on this. Let's see what Pajaco had to say. Uh, <clears throat> sadly, I had to give up playing after about 30 minutes because it actually gave me motion sickness. Mm. At its core, I made it's a it very early that. 3D platform game. Technically impressive, but the whole quickly becomes very samey. I couldn't quite work out the emotion game, how, how the emotion game differed that from the garbage. action game <laughs> other than the time limit. I started out in meditation and got bashed around by other polygonal creatures and couldn't get to any platforms not relaxing at all. <laughs> the ST runs poorly. The DOS version just ran too quick on the mister. That core of the mist is a little... Yeah, you gotta, you gotta way tone it down. I had... Well, I mean, you can't do much. I had a brief spell with the Amiga version, which is better than the ST version. DOS, if you can get it running, okay, is clearly the better version to play. I recommend, I recommend using Exo DOS if you've got it. Uh, maybe I'm missing something due to not having uh, been able to play it for long. Nope. It is a nice concept, but the whole thing feels more like a tech demo than a full game, 5 out of 10. I'm yeah. going to disagree with both. I, I don't disagree with that at all. I'm going to disagree with both of you. I think this is a game. I think you should check out both the games today. And if you've got an Amiga or an ST sitting around, 
Blowing up alpha waves, also it's also known under another name, Continuum. Yes, that was its that was a DOS. A, its American release ver, uh, yeah. name was Continuum. Alpha waves better. Uh, but, uh, I think Continuum was fine. Uh, yeah, but Continuum sounds somewhat, some, like a something else. Alpha wave because this gets you in an alpha state. Oh, it messes alpha. with your mind. That's what I like about it. It's a fun, unique puzzle platformer stripped down as far as you can take something like this. I think it's a. a, a uh, a chilly vision of things to come. Speaking of things to come, uh, the Brent, it's time to talk about our favorite pal, our good buddy. It's Frank over at Retro Rewind. That that's your segue. Well, I'm not done yet. You just you jilt it in right there because you know when you deal with RetroRewind.ca, there are always great things to come because there's always new goodies coming down the pike. At RetroRewind.ca. Yes. Frank has recently uh, released uh, the uh, A600 Accelerator. Get your A600, your Mega 600. Remember when that thing came out? What a dud. Everybody hated that machine. It didn't do nothing. <laughs> it was horrible. And now, it's the most coveted Amiga you could possibly have. Well, it's not. It's not true. But it's still a big deal. that You slap one of these accelerators in it, and now you got something, brother. This thing will fly. Uh, Frank will support all of your Commodore machines, not just the Amiga, your C64, your C128, even your oddball Commodore machines like the C16, the CDTV. Aww, poor C16. Well, it's an oddball, I'm just saying. You know, uh, the Plus 4, they're all there. And on top of everything else, he'll give you a little uh, love for your handy TRSA color computers. Frank has cap kits. Frank has accoutrement accessories. Yes. Anything you could possibly want uh, for these old machines. Frank also will take care of you in terms of service. Does your old plus? Does your old uh, C uh, sixteen? Does it uh, act weird? Weird colors on the screen or whatever. It's to Frank. Does your CDTV need recap? But you don't have the jack. You don't feel like getting in there all the time. Frank will do it. He does all that stuff, and he does it at a decent price. That's Frank over at RetroRewind.ca. You know, you I heard that? a story, Aaron. Please. I heard a story. Someone sent in their their C16 that yeah. had waxed up colors, right? Yeah, that's the worst. And Frank got it. He fixed it. Yeah. Right? And he sent it back, and the guy said, like, man, these colors are still waxed up. Yeah. Brain hemorrhage. Oh, <laughs> that's a horrible story. You're an idiot. <laughs> Frank at RetroRewind.ca. Seriously, check him out. He's an incredible dude, and he will repair your stuff. That's... Would you just get the wheel? How did you botch that? <laughs> You're a moron. <laughs> What'd you add this week? Uh, this week we have video games banned. The video games <laughs> banned. That's what. What did you add? Video games banned for dumb reasons by oh. Super Tech Four. Oh, that's a good idea. And what's the retro rewind piece? The right? retro rewind piece is button mashers. Oh boy. And something else to explain. We do have the retro rewind pie piece. Uh -huh. If that bad boy hits, we wipe the board completely, put on all retro rewind pieces. Spin it up, and we'll put the other pieces back. We don't do that in by. real time, do Yes, we, we do, Oh, my God. God. Are you ready, Aaron? I don't know after hearing that. You got a piece coming out. This looks hokey to me. And the winner is... What'd you get? The winner is... Japanese Arcade Exclusives by Happy Coding. All right, Japanese Japanese Arcade Exclusives. That shouldn't be too tough. That, now, how are we going to play that? Does that mean it ne these are games that never came to the States? Is that what we're saying well, here? Yeah, exclusive to Japan. Well, That's, I didn't know. I don't what? understand these rules. This isn't a hard concept. Happy Coding. Uh, uh, pick that one, Danny. That's it a, is. That's an interesting one. So these are games that never made it to the States. They had to be in the arcade in Japan. That's what yes. I'm saying. Ja well, that, yeah, that's how Japanese arcade exclusives okay. work. <laughs> Listen, you have to spell it out for dummy, okay? What do you want from me? Hey, everyone. Uh, I want to make a quick announcement. Uh, in September, you know, it's coming quicker than you think, uh, the brand. It'll be upon us soon. Uh, September 24th, it's all going down. It's time, once again, for another round of the International Computer Club. We're going to hook it up. And this time, I guarantee, smooth sailing, no internet trouble. That's for suckers. What, can, what are the odds that that could happen two times in a row? they got to be low. So we're going to get together for another International Computer Club. That's when everyone who's interested comes in and gives presentations 
uh, for a cast of thousands, an audience of millions that sit back and watch this and enjoy it on Twitch. Uh, we've got a sign-up sheet right now uh, in the Discord in the International Computer Club section. Uh, if you're not on our Discord, don't think that we're excluding you. We love you. We love everyone. Please uh, drop me a note at argpresents at mail.com if you're interested in signing up and presenting uh, or if you're a vendor or if you're someone that wants to uh, demonstrate a product. It's all good. And there is really nothing out of bounds. Uh, arcade, console, computer stuff. Anything you want to talk about books. Uh, Rob did one on making these Raspberry Pi movie poster gimmick, which was pretty cool. Remember that? So Raspberry Pi projects. There's nothing off limits. 3D printing. We love it. Get it all in there. We've already had a couple signups. Our good buddy David Z has already uh, put his name on the dotted line. And Chris Edwards, uh, if you're familiar with his uh, great channel, uh, of Amiga repairs. He's already signed up to demonstrate something. Lord only knows what he's going to get into, Brent, because he's a crazy man. So if you're interested, please, again, head over to the Discord and sign up. There's a sign-up sheet pinned to the top. Just uh, once you open it up, it will be pretty self-evident what you're supposed to do. Again, this will be the 24th of September. I think we're going to start this thing about 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the Brent should be a lot of fun. Anything you want to announce before we take this thing to the house? Nope. There it is. Brent doesn't have anything to announce. So, Next week, it's going to be games exclusive to Japanese arcades. And until next time, vive la France! Thanks for joining us today. We really hope you enjoyed the show. A special thank you to Devin Styles for our vector style graphics and Bartbit for our amazing music. Would you like to help keep ARG spinning? You can do so at patreon.com slash ARG presents. Just like these fine folks. Dryerlet 17. The Ron Garoop. Templar Mar, Z9K9, Jerry Dennington, John Dykeman, Retroalogy, Air Shack, Texas Foosballer, Sundown, O'Raw, Super Tech Boy, David Terrence, Mr. B, Roushy, Ram, W. Betke, Dave Velociraptor, Bernhardt Lucas, Steve Rathmason, Anthony Jarvis, Bitter Blitter, Jocko 6502, Kevin Bean, Andy Jones, Andy Craig, Rob Flack O'Hara, Jason Warns, Misiyama, Chris Foles, Frodo and L, The Slow Norris, Terry Howard, Lola Hope, and Rolo. They all have access to our Discord channel. Their name called out in the credits and visualized in the ending scene. Have an idea for a wheel piece? You can send it to us at argpresents at mail.com.